Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Canada gives a rare honor to global activist Malala Yousafzai. If Canada leads, I know the world will follow. But as she praised this country, she had a pointed message for another. The toxic legacy of a former high-tech superstar. Will taxpayers foot the bill? The sudden death of a Canadian pioneer in the fight against HIV AIDS. Plus thousands slain in the Philippines' war on drugs. It raises a lot of questions. Who's telling the truth? It took a few years for it to become official, due in part to the very kind of violence she resists. But Malala Yousafzai is now an honorary Canadian. The young woman from Pakistan is only the sixth person to be offered such recognition in this country. Joining Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama, Aung San Suu Kyi, the Aga Khan, and Raoul Wallenberg. As the CBC's David Cochran tells us, Yousafzai accepted with grace and with a plea to her new country to help carry out her work. Malala Yousafzai began her day in Ottawa with the simple act of going to high school. You all are blessed to have the opportunity to read, to learn, to come to school. It's the cause she lives for and the cause she nearly died for. At just 15, Malala was shot in the face by a Taliban gunman, determined to silence her advocacy for the education of young girls. That act of violence pushed her onto the world stage as an ambassador for peace. We were reminded that a bullet is no match for an idea. The world needs leadership based on serving humanity, not based on how many weapons you have. Canada can take that lead. Now 19, Malala used this stage as she has every other to champion the education of women and girls and in this case, urge Canada to lead. Bring world leaders together and raise new funding for girls to go to school. If Canada leads, I know the world will follow. Before her speech, Malala received her honorary citizenship in the parliamentary library, a fitting backdrop for someone who braved death in her own country to access books and learning. Every morning I would hear the news that more innocent people have been killed. I saw men with big guns in the streets. As her family watched, Malala used this platform to praise Canada for helping refugees and to send a message to the United States. I pray that you continue to open your homes and your hearts to the world's most defenseless children and families. And I hope your neighbors will follow your example. She was honored for courage in the face of violence in a ceremony that was delayed by violence. This is my first trip to Canada, but not my first attempt. This was originally scheduled for that day in 2014, when Corporal Nathan Cirillo was murdered and Parliament Hill attacked. The man who attacked Parliament Hill called himself a Muslim, but he did not share my faith. He did not share the faith of one and a half billion Muslims living in peace around the world. But today, Parliament was a place of celebration, filled with warm greetings and loud applause, a grand welcome for the country's newest honorary citizen. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Many people know that Malala Yousafzai's family, and especially her father, have been key to her becoming the person she is, encouraging her education and public advocacy. But while at that Ottawa school today, she revealed a lesser known way her father challenged the norms around girls in Pakistan in the late 1990s. And in the beginning, uh, when uh, my father's cousin brought a family tree of our family, and in that family tree, it was all about men. There was no woman's name in that. And it went back like, I don't know, 300 years. And at that time, only I was born. My uh, two brothers weren't there. There was a peaceful time. And, uh, but at that time, in that family tree, my father wrote my name, and that was the first girl's name that was ever written in a family tree, which was all men before. 
Yusuf Sai says while the cousin laughed at her father at the time, he is now one of her biggest supporters. Well, for all the talk about the relationship between the Trump White House and the Putin Kremlin, there's been precious little public contact. That changed today. With Syria front and center of their agenda, the top U.S. and Russian diplomats met in Moscow. And if you take each man at his word, the relationship is not good. Susan Ormiston explains. In one whipsaw week, the U.S. president trashed any prospect of warmer relations with Russia. Right now, we're not getting along with Russia at all. We may be at an all-time low in terms of uh, relationship with Russia. That U.S. missile attack to punish Syria last week, the backdrop for a tense first meeting today in Moscow between America's top diplomat and Russia's, and behind the scene, President Vladimir Putin. Tillerson told him the obvious. There is a low level of trust between our two countries. The world's two foremost nuclear powers cannot have this kind of relationship. But how to dig out of the mess, with President Trump calling Bashar al-Assad an animal? Frankly, if Russia didn't go in and back this animal, you wouldn't have a problem right now. And UN Ambassador Nikki Haley today lecturing Russia at the Security Council. You are isolating yourselves from the international community every time one of Assad's planes drop another barrel bomb on civilians. With little effect. Those against? As Russia used its veto for an eighth time to scuttle UN sanctions on Syria. Against all this, Rex Tillerson and Sergei Lavrov tried to open channels. I see you got the Madrid. We still have many prospects for cooperation. Russia is willing to cooperate with the U.S. to, to be engaged in a dialogue. They did agree on an independent investigation into the chemical attack and on resuming a deconfliction hotline for military cooperation in the air over Syria. But among the biggest divides, Bashar al-Assad, the U.S. wants Russia to pressure him out. Our view is that the reign of the Assad family is coming to an end. No sign today that Russia agrees on that. The diplomatic dance in Moscow did not inflame tensions, and at best, they're still talking. The U.S. is still sending mixed messages about Russia's role in the chemical attack. Tillerson said clearly today the U.S. has no evidence to say Russia was involved. But later, his boss, President Trump, said it's possible, but probably unlikely, that Syria launched the attack without Russia's knowledge. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. He was a leader and a giant in the field of AIDS research right from the beginning. Part of the team that first figured out how 3TC could be used to fight the deadly illness. And Montreal physician Dr. Mark Weinberg remained a giant in the field right up until his accidental death yesterday. Allison Northcott has more. Probably still enough. Mark Weinberg was an international leader in AIDS research, working for decades to understand drug resistance of the virus and advocating to give people around the world access to treatment. We will effectively contribute with time to a solution to the AIDS problem. Clear clearly, that's our goal. He was recognized in 1989 for his part in identifying 3TC as an antiretroviral drug, which is still used today in combination with other medications to treat people with HIV. We have transformed an HIV infection status from what used to be sure death to now representing a chronic manageable condition. For Dr. Réjean Thomas, Weinberg was a mentor. He was very interested to the life of human uh, defending the gay community, defending the, uh, the sex workers in Africa. Uh, so he, and he was so well uh, respected. Weinberg headed two research institutes in Montreal and taught at McGill University. He received multiple honors throughout his career and helped organize AIDS conferences around the world, including the first major one ever held in a developing country in Durban, South Africa in 2000 when he was president of the International AIDS Society. He's remembered as a pioneer in his field whose work made a difference. He was not content of uh, treating people for them to have a, a nice, nice uh, lifespan. He wanted also to get to the cure 
for HIV. So he started several projects, and I think this still this work will still um, will still go on. Police in Val Harbor, Florida, confirmed Weinberg's death this afternoon. He had been swimming in rough waters and ran into trouble. The son swam out to where he had seen his dad, was able to locate him began to swim back to shore with him. He was transported on the, uh, to the hospital where he was pronounced. Weinberg remained committed to his work right to the end of his life, even at 71, telling colleagues he had no plans to retire. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Coming up, a public health measure saved lives in New York while Canada dragged its feet. We could have saved potentially thousands of heart attacks and strokes in Canada. Plus, the Philippines' war on drugs. <laughs> Why some say it's really a war on the poor. These days, when Canadians hear Nortel, they probably think less about its success as an early tech giant and more about its demise. That demise has become its legacy, both in how its employees suffered financially, but in a lesser known way too, what it did to the environment and how Canadian taxpayers, not Nortel, are paying for the cleanup. Julie Arden explains. This is where they uh, basically, I think, came out here to do all the testing. Darwin Hoskin surveys the property at Nortel's former plant in Belleville. He worked here for 38 years. The company is gone, but a toxic legacy remains. Nobody really knew, and obviously at this point, um, we can see some of the impacts of, of what happens when the rules aren't followed, even though there weren't any rules back then. Old Nortel sites in Kingston, London and Brockville are all contaminated with VOCs, volatile organic compounds, chemicals that were used in these telephone equipment factories. Contaminants here in Belleville are now affecting the neighbours. Solvents used to clean equipment weren't properly disposed of. This contaminated the groundwater with cancer-causing chemicals. A toxic plume migrated to the elementary school next door. Before remediation, tests showed low levels of gas from the contaminants inside the school. Students and staff had to move out for six months. Under the advice of public health officials, a new ventilation system was installed as a precaution. Our first and foremost priority was uh, ensuring the safety of our staff and our students, and so the decision was made uh, to make the rec uh, renovations as were suggested. The board says the air is now safe at the school, but the toxic plume remains and will eventually need to be cleaned up at a cost. Mark Matson worries it's more than a financial that, liability. That, that contaminated water is also leaching into the air and offing gases. It's ultimately making its way into our rivers and our streams and our creeks, creeks and getting into our fish and our birds. Ontario's Ministry of the Environment and several other Nortel creditors claim hundreds of millions of dollars from the Nortel estate. Lawyers that are associated with the Nortel case say the best they can hope for is half of their claims. The rest of the cleanup costs will go to the taxpayer. Julie Ayrton, CBC News, Ottawa. Julie mentioned the 800 or so polluted and toxic sites across Ontario. Across Canada, the number is more like 23,000. They include everything from old dry cleaners to abandoned gas stations to the giant mine site. Under Canadian law, it is incumbent on the polluter today, but as with Nortel, when there is no money, the cleanup can fall to taxpayers. In Langley, BC, a man died in an overnight fire at a seniors complex. I could see the flames and the sparks and the smoke, and then somebody started yelling, so I called the fire department, and they told me to get, pull the alarm and get everybody out of the building, so I did. That warning meant all other residents got out. Some of the elderly needed help from emergency crews down three flights of stairs. Damage is extensive, and more than 60 seniors are now without a home. A member of the Canadian Forces has been charged with sexual assault. Private Bryant Taylor is accused of assaulting three fellow students during basic training at a base in Quebec. Military police say they thoroughly investigate all sexual assault complaints, and these charges show progress in that effort. The CEO of United Airlines heaped anguish upon apology today as the company tried to manage a continuing public relations nightmare. 
The video showing a passenger being dragged down the aisle of an airplane is seared into the Internet's unforgiving memory. And today, another video of the incident emerged. Ron Charles has the story. Video released today shows the moments just before Dr. David Dow was dragged off a United Airlines flight. No, I'm not going. In it, he is telling airport security officers he's not giving up his seat to make room for an airline employee commuting to work. The passenger who recorded the video says Dow remained calm. I did not see him at all ever try to raise his hands against the police. He was not fighting them. He just wasn't getting up. I mean, he was resisting moving, um, so they had to you know, rip him up out of the seat. Seconds later, those now famous images of a security officer dragging Dow down the aisle, battered and bloodied to the shock of fellow passengers. United Airlines CEO Oscar Munoz at first admonished Dow as a belligerent, disruptive passenger, then late yesterday released an apology for his treatment. This morning, in an interview with ABC News, he went further, saying he felt shame. The first thing I think is important to say is to apologize to Dr. Dow, um, his family, uh, the passengers on that flight, our customers, our employees. That is not who our family at United is. The CEO's contrition comes after angry reaction on social media in China to a doctor of Asian background being dragged from a plane. United has more direct flights to cities in China than any other North American airline, leading experts in Chinese investing to offer dire warnings. This plays really badly in China. Many people in China are interpreting this, rightly or wrongly, as this gentleman was chosen because he's Asian, because he's Chinese or Vietnamese. That's the perception, and perception is everything. Dow's lawyer sought a court order today compelling United to protect all records of the flight and incident, typically the first step when launching a lawsuit. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Military officials in the Philippines say they have killed a militant who was involved in the beheadings of two Canadians. They say the man known as Abu Rami and several other members of the group Abu Sayyaf were shot dead during an armed confrontation. Last year, the group kidnapped and killed John Ridsdale and Robert Hall. A bit later, we'll show you another cause of grief in the Philippines, a popular war on drugs that's claiming thousands of lives. But first, the very real threat that could be in your food the Shushwap leaders seem to be the best hope for a peaceful resolution, but the police have made it clear the resources are available for deployment at a moment's notice. What happens when this melts? Every year for more than a century, Toronto has had a January thaw. When it happens this year, the fear is that the catch basins and the sewers will be overwhelmed. So how is it that a huge moose cannot protect itself against a tiny tick? Well, some naturalists say it's a problem of evolution. The ticks were here first. NORAD is so certain it can handle any airborne threats, it offered CBC News a chance to ride along and watch. This is, in many ways, an Olympic first, one that wouldn't have seemed necessary or even imaginable before September 11th. This is one of the largest Israeli offensives in years, and the military says it will not leave Rafa until it has destroyed all of the tunnels used by the militants to smuggle weapons into Gaza from Egypt. The trending the opposition parties describe is accurate, then who tells Robert Mugabe that it's over? Some are theorizing that the reason the election commission is taking so long to announce the results is that the ruling party is trying to find a way for it and Robert Mugabe to save face. How many men kidnapped you and your family? Actually, in my list, there were 24. A gentleman who keeps meticulous notes. He said he made a decision in the jungle. In order to protect his community, he'd have to find the Abu Sayyaf, catch the kidnappers himself, and then kill them. Did you, did you really mean that? I did. Burma wants the business of the world, and the business of the world certainly wants into Burma. This could be the new beginning. 
Just about the only thing it seems that will stop the exponential spread of this virus is if more people manage to make it to treatment centers like this one. Right now in Liberia only about 18 percent of the people with Ebola are coming to clinics like this. The rest are being treated at home, potentially infecting everyone else around them. Until that changes, Ebola will just keep winning. One more time. Watch a curve behind you, John. Just some just when there was beginning to be a sense that maybe this was calming down, someone set fire to a car, people started running, and here come the riot police. We've been warned for years that trans fats are bad for us. Now the results of a bold move made by New York City a decade ago are adding more evidence. And it comes just as a Canadian ban arrives under the radar. Health reporter Vic Adopia has the details. At New York restaurants, all manner of fried foods and creamy pastries are still on the menu. What's not are artery-clogging added trans fats specifically partially hydrogenated oils. They haven't been for almost a decade after the city's health board banned them from eateries. Some parts of the state followed suit, others didn't. Naturally, researchers wanted to see what difference, if any, the ban made after just three years. And when we looked at what happened after bans were implemented, we found that there's a 6.2% decline in heart attacks and stroke. <laughs> In New York City alone, researchers estimate the ban prevented more than 4,000 heart attacks and strokes. Two grams of added trans fats significantly increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. This order of fries contains almost double that. Now, this same restaurant eliminated partially hydrogenated oils in U.S. cities where they were banned. But for the rest of the U.S. and Canada, it's business as usual. Now, that wasn't supposed to be the case in this country. Voluntary strategies don't work. The NDP's motion to ban added trans fats was actually approved in 2004 in a rare show of parliamentary solidarity. But it still took five ministers of health and two elections to put the ban in place. That happened late Friday with little fanfare. Next year, partially hydrogenated oils will be classified as a contaminant. This Toronto cardiologist says the Yale study shows the price of Canada's public policy dithering. We could have saved potentially thousands of heart attacks and strokes in Canada. Abramson says she's long warned her own patients to not wait for the government to act. Pick up a label, read it, and make a healthy choice. Health Canada's ban was of little surprise, at least for Canadian processed food makers that sell to the U.S., where added trans fat will also be completely banned next year. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. If spring weather already has you thinking about summer road trips, a bit of bad news today. Gas prices took a sudden jump up in many places. Annoying for sure, but as Havard Gould reports, paying more of the pump is a staple of the season. This spring is worse than most. The changeover to summer gasoline with a different formula for warmer temperatures always pushes prices up. But the sharp increases this spring, as much as 8% in a day, are catching drivers by surprise. They're paying uh, one, one twenty, one nine. <laughs> that's that's insane. The weak loony hurts. The cost of carbon pricing in Canada may be a factor too, but analysts are putting a lot of the blame somewhere else. Americans are driving more and burning more gasoline as the U.S. economy strengthens. This 840 horsepower monster. This week, Fiat Chrysler unveiled this new model, an enormously powerful sports car that illustrates that growing thirst and the reduced interest in fuel efficiency south of the border. We're almost broadsided by what happens in the United States. This fuel forecaster says Canadians shouldn't expect the price of gas to retreat at all until the fall. And it's likely to go a little higher because the Canadian market follows the U.S. market to a T. No one ever enjoys paying more. It's actually pretty expensive to, because uh, I have two jobs and most of my paycheck's going towards gas. 
And this summer, Canadians are being encouraged to hit the road, to explore their country on its 150th anniversary. Something that may be a hard sell for those who believe that paying for the daily commute is already too much. Harvard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. Jeffrey Orridge is stepping down as commissioner of the Canadian Football League. He took on the post two years ago after serving as head of CBC Sports. The CFL praised Orridge for his work on diversity as well as player health and safety. That despite some controversy last November when Orridge concluded the link between football injuries and degenerative brain disease is still unproven. Today, Orridge said he and the CFL board have differing views on the future of the league. The Bank of Canada left its key overnight rate unchanged today, saying it's too early to declare the economy is on a sustainable growth path. So it stands at 0.5%. The bank's current forecast expects the economy will continue to grow, but at a moderate pace. Up next, the Philippines' war on drugs claimed thousands of lives in mere months. What you hear from them is that, oh, we're poor, oh, we're innocent, but that's not true. The death toll has stirred international outrage, but many Filipinos seem just fine with an endless string of slaughter on the streets. But first, let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX fell 78 points. The dollar closed up three-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 59 points. The price of oil dropped 29 cents a barrel. A track star nowadays has to be followed around by a doping official almost any time she wins a major event. What the testers are mainly looking for here is the subject of an international ban. Anabolic steroids, a derivative of the male sex hormone which is supposed to build muscle. The athletes say all this doping control business is a bit of a waste of time and money, which is something the Canadian team does not have in abundance. Good evening. The nation is in shock tonight over the downfall of a Canadian hero. Ben Johnson, who made the country so proud on Friday, was, just hours ago, thrown out of the Olympics for taking drugs, steroids. Oh, that's devastating. It makes me wonder what's happening to Canadian athletics. It's the biggest disappointment anybody could ever imagine. In this Montreal lab, scientists test the blood and urine of athletes for signs of drug use, signs of cheating. There's no shortage of work and much more to come now that Montreal has been named headquarters of the World Anti-Doping Agency. There will be more pressure on Canadian athletes, but not only Canadian athletes, all athletes around the world. Europe's fastest sprinter has become the latest athlete to test positive for a new designer steroid called THG. The drug is at the heart of a widening doping scandal in the U.S. Fortunes have fallen for American sprinter Marion Jones. American cyclist Floyd Landis has admitted to using performance-enhancing drugs. Lance Armstrong has finally coughed up what was pretty much an open secret. Do you feel disgraced? Of course. If you're the second best athlete in the world, you might do anything to be number one. Whether there's testing or whether there isn't testing. This is Mordecai Richler, a Canadian writer now living in England. And these are some of the things he writes. Young people are leaving Canada, one, because they feel there is no opportunity for them at home, and two, because they're bored. It's a small country, and if you're an English-speaking Canadian, there's certainly no capital. The cultural capitals are either New York or London. Another reason I, I write is uh, it's this continuing attempt to evolve a standard or a position or a moral posture. And I, I work it out in my books, and I'm still working it out. My loyalty, so what I think of as Canada, is really Montreal, the Laurentians, the region surrounding the city. Uh, I tend to feel something of a stranger in other parts of Canada. I have no overwhelming sense of country. I'm not the most pretentious of writers. I, I write for my own pleasure and for my friends, and, and I hope to find as wide an audience as possible. Uh, I try to be um, an honest witness to my times. You have been known to make rather rude statements in public, probably slightly under the influence of... No, that's not fair. I mean, uh, what I mean is, uh, I wasn't necessarily under the influence of anything. 
You mean you can be rude without drinking, is that? <laughs> if called upon. Multiculturalism was a very well-intended notion like most Canadian notions, but not very bright like most Canadian notions. I, I'm trying to tell the truth. I don't think that it's um, uh, something that has to be in season like hockey or hay fever. I think you should be able to tell the truth at any time. And if it makes people uncomfortable, I can't help it. Well, I think I'm very fortunate in that uh, most men work at jobs they dislike intensely because they have to support a family, and, and most women do. So anyone who's being paid to do work he enjoys is, is very privileged in this world. And I, I don't have to ingratiate myself with anybody or taint my work in order to make it appealing. So I'm very lucky. So now they're taking the body to the funeral parlor. And the family's going to follow. A bloody battle is being waged in the streets of the Philippines. Thousands of drug pushers and users executed in a matter of months. It began last summer after President Rodrigo Duterte promised to wipe out every drug lord. In truth, the actual victims tend to be poor. Global human rights groups scream for the killing to stop, and briefly, it did, but no longer. And some of the scenes you're about to see are very disturbing. Here's our senior correspondent, Adrian Arsenault, with Operation Double Barrel Reloaded. It's 11 to 5 minutes before 12 midnight. It's a weird soundtrack to snooze by. And it's a weird place to sleep, too. The press room of the Manila police station and the photographers on the night shift who need a lot more rest than they're about to get. They're competitors who share tips. Four kilometers from here. Share cars, watch each other's backs. You okay? They have to, because the murders keep happening. They get lost. Okay, who's this next victim? Who's yeah. this? If the pack has a leader, the leader is Rafi Lerma. When you begin to feel that sometimes there's no more killings in the past week for so many days, maybe this is stopping, right? Then this happens again. It's been hard hunting down the stories of the more than 7,000 people killed in the Philippines' drug war since last summer. Worse, he says, though, would be to look away. I don't want that day to happen when everyone loses interest and you see no one's covering this anymore. Or just sees it as normal. Yeah. My campaign against drugs will not stop until the last pusher and the last drug lord are <laughs> when the philippines president made that promise arguing his nation could become a narco state if drug use isn't stopped masked men sometimes police sometimes just thugs started killing with abandon Murderers who suffocated their victims by wrapping their heads in tape, often writing pusher or addict on signs left with the bodies. When corrupt cops were exposed for some of these killings, the offensive was put on hold. But it's back. Official orders to police are to try to just arrest suspects. But the blood still flows. And it sometimes looks like this, and sounds like stunned silence. A drive-by shooting by masked men. Police quick to say they happened to find a packet of shabu or meth on the victim. Vincent Go, as much a regular as Rafi. He says you hear the claim often of finding drugs. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Anybody ever held to account for these murders? No. Never. Until now, no. No, that's the sad thing about it. 
do you think that the deaths are still being counted properly or, or do no. you think no, no I, I think uh, people lost count of the killings right now real numbers are suddenly hard to come by Newspapers that once diligently tracked the deaths don't seem to anymore, and official updates on cases are rare. There certainly isn't much news on a death Vince can't shake. Is following up on this night. And this one is Christina. Christina Padual's death. When she was shot, she was uh, slumped on the chair. His photo of the moment is hard to take. During things like this, everybody seems to be afraid to talk. They should have seen, seen everything, but they refused to talk to the media. By the time he and the other photographers got to the scene, police had already announced they'd found traces of Shabu on Christida. Another man nearby was shot ten times. She was hit twice while sitting eating watermelon. And that's her, her last meal. And nobody's talking, so it's really hard who was the real target. It's really hard to say if who was the real target of the shooting. Add the absence of answers to the family's pain here at her wake. The photographers keep an eye on a lot of families. Christida's is a real concern. Like most of the grieving from the drug war, they struggle to make ends meet. Which explains this. In full view of the coffin, strangers mostly, not really mourners. They've been gambling for days and nights, keep most of the winnings. Christina's family gets a small cut. For many of the poorest families, this is the only way to pay for the funeral. So here's the really sad math on this. In order to get her body back, Christina's father had to pay the funeral home up front about $700. That's money he really didn't have. All this fundraising from the gambling is supposed to pay for it, but the best they seem to be able to do is about $10 a day. See that interment notice? The date has been left blank because until there's money for the funeral, the family couldn't book one. And she's already been dead a few weeks. This is where one particular photographer is a lifeline. Brother June, they call him. He does double duty also, working with the church. He takes on a lot, this guy. Yeah. Yeah, he takes on a lot, and you usually see him asleep in the side of the car because he has duties during the morning in the church, duties, and at night still goes out with us. When Brother June's colleagues on the night shift explain Christida's case, the congregation at his church raised the rest of the money for the funeral. He's here to deliver it. Now they can bury her. He's also offering legal help, but the family doesn't want it. They are afraid because they don't know what's the, the killer. They don't know what's the other motivation. Are they going to file a case, no, do you no, think? No, 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 no. It's nothing to mind. They want to forget everything. So there may never be answers about Christina's death. Back at the police station, Brother June's brief chance to sleep. <laughs> For the other photographers, it's a moment to really look carefully at their pictures. The closer the shot, they say, the bigger the clues they always seem to find. It was, his hands was bound. Police say this man was killed because he pulled that gun. But look at the man's wrist in Rafi's picture. It looks like cuff marks. It just looks unbelievable. How do you pull a gun if your hands are cuffed? See in the photo. It's hardly a unique image in this drug war. Flip through their files, and the same scenario pops up at scene after scene. And there's a lot of blood on the hands, both hands, actually. Both hands, but look at the gun. It's clean. When you look at this, that suggests what to you? Well, I can say it, it raises a lot of questions. Who's telling the truth? This drug war needs more understanding. It's not black and white. And they're just pushers. Kill them. No. We are humans. We have to... Well, look at them as humans.
But Rafi and Vince and the others can't always make people feel what they feel. Certainly not those in charge. The complaint is utterly baseless. You know who are afraid of the Duterte presidency? Only the criminals, the scoundrels, and the corrupt politicians. No, I'm not trying to say it. I'm saying it. This is Salvador Panella, President Duterte's legal advisor in the middle of a live radio interview. Hi there. <laughs> I'm Adrian Arsenault. Do you worry about Filipinos waking up to see an image like that? He's seen the pictures of Christida and the others, but isn't ready to be outraged. But no relatives will even admit that if, she, if that woman was involved in drugs, they will never admit that. Mm -hmm. So we don't know whether it's a member of the syndicate who did that. What you hear from them is that, oh, we're poor, oh, we're innocent. But that's not true. You, you don't sound terribly compassionate to people who might be poor and innocent. I mean, why, why is a victim there may any be less people credible who have been than a police officer? In the process. In other words, those are collateral damages. I mean, if they're shooting each other and then suddenly a passerby, an innocent one, poor one, dies, I, I don't think you can blame that to the police. If it's he speaks with the confidence of a man who is sure President Duterte and his drug war remain wildly popular no matter what questions get asked. And in the big picture, he's right. It's interesting because this drug war doesn't seem to be killing the drug lords, but low-level users, the poor who live in these densely populated neighborhoods. Maybe someone's killing them to keep them quiet. So you might think these places would be full of rage about Duterte, but they're not. His popularity is overwhelming. People talk of feeling safer now, even right down there at Christina's wake. <laughs> On the day of Christina's funeral, even the woman cooking for the mourners talks about the drug war as a type of cleaning house. Here in our place, for how many months? Not so good. Is it better now? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if you are going here at uh, midnight, oh, no people will uh, with you. No, no, no people. No harassment, no honor. So it's better. His, his drug war has okay. made it better for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Several weeks since they lost her, Christina's family is finally able to bury her. Where they head to is an overcrowded cemetery crammed now with the victims of the drug war. It's a frenzy. Families colliding, crushed for space. It's hard to eke out time for rituals here. They'll lease the burial compartment for just five years. After that, they'll have to pay yearly to keep her body here. Many can't afford to. Christina's cousin, Bernice, can't seem to take this all in. Many, 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 many drug lords. I wish that all that killed, not her, because she, she's so funny, girl. she's so nice, and she's kind for us. It is blazing, dizzyingly hot for all the mourners and those photographers. When we come back, they're about to embark on a night that will rattle them. Okay, we'll get out will rattle everyone. Hi there, everyone on Facebook. I'm Adrian. Uh, we are obviously in a commercial break on The National. We're actually between parts one and part two of the documentary that, that we prepared on the drug war in the Philippines. That's one uh, I worked on with the producer, Sylvia Thompson, the shooter, Jean-Francois Bisson, the editor, Brenda Whitmer. These are great teammates, by the way. If you, you know, we have a lot of them here, but this is a pretty spectacular team. Um, what you're about to see in part two is the extent to which these photographers are really pushed to the extremes, both emotionally 
and, and professionally and physically in some cases. And if you have the time, I think it's really worth it. Have a look at their Instagram pages of Rafi Lerma and Vincent Goh. Those addresses should be popping up uh, in the comments down below in Facebook. It's really worth it to get a measure of, of what these, these photographers do and the extent they go to, to report what they see. So we're here just for the commercial break. If I can answer any of your questions, please send them on. If we can't get to them tonight, we'll try to get back to you uh, in the next uh, few days. So what have we got here? Um, oh, wow, lots of good questions here. Why Kellyanne McCurran. And Kellyanne, I'm sorry if I've just screwed this up. She, you're asking, why doesn't Duterte put as much effort into going after Abu Sayyaf as he does uh, those involved with drugs? Well, I think some people would argue, firstly, that he does put the same effort in, sort of the same attitudinal vigor, if you will, into that. The war against Abu Sayyaf, these are the people who, who do the horrific kidnappings and beheadings of the light the lakes that took the lives of the Canadians. Uh, the war on them has been pretty vicious. Uh, the Philippine military goes very hard at Abu Sayyaf. In fact, in, in trying to save the lives of the Canadians, 30 soldiers uh, from the Philippine military, according to the Philippine military, were killed in the process. And just today, one of the Abu Sayyaf leaders involved in the beheading was also killed. So I think, I think arguably, uh, Rodrigo Duterte is not a soft man policy-wise on anything he does, and that's reflected in that, certainly in the drug war and Abu Sayyaf. So, what's another one? What have we got here? Uh, I, Joyce Meek, you asked a good question early on, which is that, where's the voice of the people? Uh, I'm not entirely sure the range of what you were getting at there, but you have to know that the response in the Philippines is very complicated. So you have some people, like the woman you saw in the story, who says, you know, for me, it's safer. I feel safer. My family's not involved in drugs. I see people who are drug users off, off the street. That's good for me. That pers that opinion is really pervasive. You have the Catholic Church, though, which is starting to raise its voice quite loudly against this drug war. Uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, they both want the International Criminal Court and the UN to investigate this. So opinion is very mixed, but I can tell you on the ground, it is largely pro-Duterte and pro-drug war. So let me just see. Uh, how do you stay calm in this sort of situation? It's not me, you know, we're visitors. It's the likes of Vincent Goh and Rafi Lerma who have to learn how to stay calm. There is so much more to talk about. Right now, though, we have to go back onto the TV side of it. So we will do our best to get to your questions as soon as we can. See you soon. Careful, the Manila night shift photographers may be used to what they see, but not everyone is. Finding the location of this next body isn't easy. Rafi is perplexed as everyone else, and really, he doesn't have to be doing this. Are you technically still on leave? Yeah. <laughs> At the funeral, I gave them photos, <laughs> but I didn't put my name on it, actually. What about this cop car here? His worried bosses have told him to get off the night beat. But he can't shake the feeling he has a responsibility to be a witness, okay, even when it means a moment like this. Arriving at a scene that's hard to make out at first. There's just a tiny clump on the ground near the garbage. God, he's really little. Yeah. He was made to kneel. See? He was made to kneel. Yeah. Then shot in the head. And you said you think he's just 16? Yeah, the family's over there. He looks really young. They said that they were searching for him for five days already. Then the barangay said they heard a shot here, and that's why they found him. That 16-year-old R.J. Soldao had been abducted by masked men who were really looking for his brother. His parents heard nothing about him until this night. Uh, so now they're taking the body to the funeral parlor. 
and the family's going to follow. All the silence of the night gone. After holding themselves so tight, somehow deep down thinking maybe it wasn't him, they suddenly caught a glimpse of his face. <laughs> that funeral home. It's strange, those worried parents had already been here earlier in the day, had given the manager a photo of RJ in case his body appeared. This was him. If your impulse is to think the cameras have no business being here, consider some families beg the photographers to stay close. Think maybe their presence, their questions, will stop funeral homes from extorting victims' families. As disgusting as that sounds, it happens a lot. Blindingly obvious thing to say, perhaps, but it is a lot of death to absorb all night, almost every night. <laughs> In the name of staying sane, the photographers have developed a ritual. After a long day, like, I feel having a home cooked meal. A meal together to close out most nights because who can just go home without working through all they've just seen? It's a few minutes before 5 a.m. Do you? Do you actually over dinner talk, talk about what Sometimes, you Sometimes, yeah. No. Maybe this looks like nonchalance. It's not. It's there every day, and their trauma sneaks in like fatigue. Because many of the photojournalists who've been covering this are, are the juniors. They're not the senior photographers, actually. So you watch out for them a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I could remember one photographer during this scene, crime scene in the rail tracks. When he was covering, he was, pardon my, uh, but he was saying, putang ina, putang ina, putang ina. He was kept on repeating that. It's son of a bitch, son of a bitch, son of a bitch. And I had to, I had to <laughs> snap him out of it. <laughs> Wake up. Wake yeah. up. For about 45 minutes, they sat there, as much about therapy as that needed meal. Brother June is in a hurry. There are already families waiting for him at the church. You're not going to bed again? No, no, I... Uh, Vince had to skip the meal altogether. His commute is just too long. The street sweepers are already out. Usually, they're the last ones to spot the bodies from the night before and send in tips, but if they're out... Thank you. And no one has heard anything, then it's over for all of them, for a few hours, anyway. If the world is to get the truth about death in the Philippines now, it will get it from them. The Manila morning rush hour is right on schedule. Time to move, to get ahead of the living, in the name of chasing the dead. A lot of tough pictures to watch throughout that item. And I, I can bet that you had a lot worse than that that yeah. you chose not to show. Um, where does this warrant on drugs in the Philippines go next? You know, it's never really easy to know. The international outcry has not gone away. You've got Amnesty International, which wants the International Criminal Court to investigate you know, the extrajudicial killings. You've got Human Rights Watch, which says, United Nations, please start looking into this. You've got the Catholic Church of the Philippines, which has started to speak out against Duterte, issue statements against him, start to shield some of the victims. But in a way, none of this matters that much because as long as Duterte has the support that he wants on the ground, and it looks like he does, then he can continue to really do what he wants. He seems very emboldened uh, by the criticisms of the outside world. He is quite happy to be dismissive of what the rest of the world says. It's a heck of a story. Thanks, Adrian. All right. right after the break, another city street and another sort of battle. An artist says his famous work has been hijacked. I'm Pia Chattopadhyay. Tomorrow on The Current, an ER doctor in Toronto and Addis Ababa, the author of Letters from the Edge of Emergency Medicine, offers a lens into society's vulnerabilities. James Maskalik on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Baby.
Five years ago today, the first telephones went on sale to the public. To give you an idea what sort of a telephone you could buy at that time, we asked the telephone company to dust off some of the ancient models stored in the basement of its University Avenue building. This attractive demonstration wasn't really in keeping with the telephone scenes of 1877. Originally, boys were employed as telephone operators. They were later replaced by girls when it was found they were too rude to customers. And this is something else that's in use now and will one day be a part of every home. It's called the video phone. If I'm off center, you can't see me anymore. So, uh... You'd only want to do that if uh, you weren't properly dressed. The size, the shape, and the color has changed a little in the past 30 years, but it still does the same thing. Or does it? The fact is that the system to which this phone is connected has changed radically. Now this uses the phone, and this does, and so does this. The telecommunications industry has produced an electronic highway. Tim Barnett is checking in with his office. Hello, buddy. He's using his new high-tech cellular phone. It's got no wires, no jacks, and it travels anywhere. The people selling it claim it's the productivity tool of the 80s. It could equally be an expensive bust. To have her call me on my uh, cellular phone, I'd appreciate it. This gadget doesn't come cheap. It costs between $2,000 and $6,000 just to get the equipment, and there's call charges on top of that. Yesterday, they were gadgets used only by the rich and powerful. Today, your local pizza delivery is likely to have one. And in next to no time, so will most of us who want to have that phone, no matter where we happen to be. Research in Motion dominates a small industrial park in Waterloo, Ontario. It invented and manufactures a pager called a BlackBerry. Its unique feature, a keyboard that allows you to send and receive email essentially in real time. Now, when Apple says it plans to make a new cell phone, people listen. Today, the company showed off its iPhone with a well, touch Samsung screen. has brought its fight for phone. smartphone supremacy to Apple's turf. If you refuse me, honey, you lose me, then you'll be left alone. Oh, baby, telephone and tell me I'm your the national <laughs> Why are they attacking you like that? It's really bad. It's really bad. That's the artist behind New York's famous Charging Bull statue on Wall Street. Today, he says his rights have been violated after the city allowed a competing statue, Fearless Girl, to stare down his creation until next year. The artist claims it distorts the bull's intended positive message. It's negative. You know, the girl is uh, right in front of this way, like, doing this. Now I'm here, what are you going to do? Fearless Girl was erected as a statement about the lack of female leadership in corporate America. Today, the entertainment world lost two people who may not have made the rank of star, but still shine very brightly in the memories of fans. And I'm looking back at him thinking to myself, you know, what are you angry about? I mean, you know where you got that shirt from. <laughs> and the damn sure was in the men's department. I mean, I kind of learned something that day. Don't they never judge a book by its cover. This cat could ball, man. Charlie Murphy was a collaborator on Dave Chappelle's acclaimed show and had several movie roles. While his career never reached the heights of his brother Eddie, he was loved by both fans and fellow comics. He died at 57 after a battle with leukemia. In my entire life, I've never heard of a hickory nut pie, never seen a hickory nut pie. You threw it in there as a ringer, didn't you? <laughs> it was very good. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and if you used to watch David Letterman, you'll remember his mom, Dorothy Mengering, had a 
long relationship with his show. On air, always ready to take her son down a notch, all the while with a motherly smile. She died yesterday, just before her son's 70th birthday, at the age of 95. That's The National this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.